Uh, this is um, tape recordings being made February 3rd, 1969, in the home of Frank Herbert in Fairfax, California. Frank and his wife Bev are sitting around, myself, Dr. Willis E. McNally of Cal State uh, English Department in Fullerton, California, sitting around talking about science fiction. And uh, Frank Herbert, as we all know, is the author of Dune and many other science fiction novels. Frank, I wonder if you'd tell us a little bit about the origins of Dune. You started a little bit earlier and you said you could trace the germinal idea. Oh, yes. The um, idea came from a, an article. I was going to do an article, which I never did, uh, about uh, the control of sand dunes. What many people don't realize is that the United States has pioneered in this how to control the flow of sand dunes. And it started up here at Florence, Oregon. There is a pilot project up there of the U.S. Forest Service, which has been so successful that it has been visited and copied by uh, experts related uh, departments from Chile, Israel, India, Pakistan, uh, Great Britain, uh, several other countries. Well, I know I drove along the uh, Oregon coast this summer, and you had mentioned this uh, a year ago that it had begun with this, you know, what was happening along Oregon. And I remember stopping at one fort there right south of the Columbia River. It's a, yeah. uh, Oregon State Park now. That's a, a story. Well, Florence is considerably south of that. South of that. Yeah. Uh, it's about centrally located on the Oregon coast. Mm -hmm. And it was an area where sand dunes blew across Highway 1, U.S. Yeah. Highway 1, frequently blocking the highway. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Forest Service put in a test station down there to determine how they could control the flow of these sand dunes. And I got fascinated by sand dunes because uh, I'm always fascinated by the idea of something that um, is either seen in miniature and then can be expanded to uh, the macrocosm, mm -hmm. or which but for the difference in time, in the flow rate and the entropy rate, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, similar to other features which we wouldn't think were similar. Uh, like how long ago was this, by the way? Oh, this was in uh, 53. This was considerably... Oh, 15 years ago. Yeah, More this was a long time ago. Um, sand dunes are like waves in a large body of water. Mm -hmm. They just are slower. And the people uh, treating them as fluid learn to control them. Fluid mechanics, in other words. That's mm -hmm. fluid mechanics with sand. Hmm. Very and the whole idea fascinated me, so I started researching sand dunes. And, of course, from sand dunes, you, it's a logical idea to go into a desert. And the way I accumulate data is I start building file folders. And before long, I saw that I had far too much for an article and far too much for a story, for a short story. So <clears throat> I didn't know really what I had, but I had an enormous amount of data and avenues shooting off at all angles to gather more, and I was following them. I can't read the dictionary, you know. I can't go look up a word. <laughs> I have to get stopped by, the, by everything else on the opposite page. <clears throat> but <clears throat> so I started accumulating these file folders, which I'll show you later. And as a result, I finally saw that I had something enormously interesting going for me about the ecology of deserts. And it was, for a science fiction writer anyway, it was an easy step from that to think, what if I had an entire planet that was a desert? And during my studies of deserts, of course, in previous studies of religions, we all know that many religions began in a desert atmosphere. <laughs> so I decided to put the two together because I don't think that any one story should have any one thread. I, I build on a layer technique. And of course, putting in religion and religious ideas with ecological ideas, you can play one against the other. Mm -hmm. Now this is, is, you see, I'm talking about the surface now. That's right. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the way things are layered. Down Within the, the novel surface. itself. That's, That's right. right, yeah. Uh, 
and the way character is developed for various reasons in the story. Mm -hmm. This is just the germ of the idea, but that's where it began. It began 15 years ago then. Well, uh, what made you, or at what point did you go from the uh, sand dunes of Oregon and the ecological background there uh, to the decision to utilize, let's say, the Arabian uh, mystique as a uh, as another counter notion or mm -hmm. contrapuntal notion working within the novel. Well, of course, in studying sand dunes, mm -hmm. you immediately get into uh, not just the Arabian mystique, but the uh, Navajo mystique and uh, uh, the mystique of the uh, uh, Kalahari primitives and Kalahari all, primitives. Yeah, the Kalahari desert. The the uh, black folk of the, oh, uh, oh. of the Kalahari mm -hmm. and how they uh, utilize every drop of water mm -hmm. and <clears throat> you can't just stop with the people who are living in this kind of environment you have to go on to how the environment works on the people and how they work on their environment mm -hmm. just the I mean, you could look at this thing on the Oregon coast quite simply if you wanted to and say, uh, yes, the sand was covering the highway and that's bad. So, so they, we plant <laughs> certain grasses and that stops the sand from moving and that's good. And that's the end of it. Yeah. See, that's mm -hmm. the end of it. But if you start going into the mechanics of how the uh, United States Forest Service set up this project and all of the internal politics, undoubtedly, that were involved, I only know part of them, but yeah. I know enough to know there were quite a few more. Uh, then you would un you would probably have a story there, mm -hmm. a Main Street type of, type of story. Yeah. But I got off on a different kick because of the science fiction angle and the emphasis on ecology. Uh, it's been my belief for a long time that a man inflicts himself on his environment. That is, Western man. I think we can see that just looking around us. Uh, uh, the uh, simple thing of. Uh, Beer used to be packed in bottles, which eventually disintegrated. Mm -hmm. Then it was packed in cans, and that took had a 50-year half-life. Mm -hmm. And now it's packed in aluminum cans, and that you know lives forever. And we're gradually Unless corrupting our water. yeah. Well, all right, but we're gradually corrupting our environment as a result of plastic. that kind of thing. Plastic is the thing that we. Do you know Bev and I were up on the Washington coast last year, and an area unspoiled originally. Mm -hmm very primitive area up the, where the Macaw tribes live and so on. Mm -hmm. And even there, down among the driftwood logs on that primitive beach, that almost unspoiled beach, you frequently, much too frequently, come on these blue, orange, green, white, plastic containers, Purex, mm -hmm. ivory soap, mm -hmm. they, and they're virtually indestructible. And there they are, they float. Well, man is then, uh, as you view him, a, a creature who ecologically is a destructive force, a divisive force. Well, we tend to uh, think uh, in Western culture, I'm talking about Western man, yeah. you realize that. Um, we tend to think that uh, we can overcome nature by a mathematical means. We accumulate enough data mm -hmm. and uh, and we just subdue the parameters of that data and yeah. subdue it. Mm -hmm. yeah, we subdue nature. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a one-pointed vision of man, because if you really start looking at, at man, uh, Western man, you'll see that uh, you could cut him right down the middle and he's blind on that backside, you see. This is a point that you made earlier, Bev, in talking about the death of uh, the planetary ecologist yes. in Dune being a very touching spot, I think you said it, very well, I moving. I thought also it was a very uh, significant point. The whole, a lot of the story swung around this, how the ecologist dies. Uh -huh. I thought it was very important that, that the, the, the planet killed the ecologist. Even though the planet, wa I mean, even though the ecologist was technically able to subdue anything within that, well, there he lay uh, d dying, dying and understanding and everything and, uh, that was happening. Exactly. Much more than someone else dying on the mm -hmm. desert would have. Mm -hmm. Complete understanding. I think it made it more horrible mm -hmm. than the fact that he completely That understood. he knew what was happening yes. to him and understood it and was technically capable of controlling it. He knew it had gotten him. Yes. This, well. of course, was done deliberately for that purpose. Mm -hmm. To turn, it's a turning point of the whole book. Mm -hmm. 
but to, to pivot, you might say. And the very fact that uh, Keynes, who is the Western man in my original construction of the book, mm -hmm. sees all of these things happening to him as mechanical things, doesn't subtract from the fact that he is still a part of this system because mm -hmm. it is observing him. Mm -hmm. He's lived out of rhythm with it and he got on the in the trough of a wave and it tumbled on him. Mm -hmm. And we are polluting our atmosphere, we're polluting our rivers, we're polluting our beaches uh, because we don't understand the principles of ecology, among other things. Well, ecology, as somebody said, uh, and I use this, I don't recall, I'd like to attribute this, but I don't recall where I encountered it. Um, I did read over 200 books in, as background on this novel. Um, somebody said that ecology is the science of understanding consequences. I lovely, remember that. Mm -hmm. Lovely expression. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and uh, uh, of course we're each of us individually is the product of everything that has happened to yeah. him. And this happened to me and hit me. <clears throat> and so I used it. Uh, because uh, as far as I was concerned, one of the purposes of this story was to delineate consequences of inflicting yourself upon a planet, upon your environment. So you have a number of forces then that are inflicting themselves upon the planet. You have the Freeman yeah. forces, you have the uh, forces of the House of Atreides, do you pronounce it? Atreides. Atreides. Uh, parenthesis, I'd love to examine with you the possible implications of the House of Atreus in the Greek legend there, end parenthesis. Um, and you have the um, off-planet forces of the Spacers Guild and the uh, em entire Imperium also as being forces inflicting themselves on this planet. Hmm. The name of the game is power, you see. Yeah. As, as it is today. Uh, we play the game today with counters called money. Mm -hmm. uh, and we talk about laws of supply and demand and so on. And, and there is a law of supply and demand as long as you only have one form of exchange. Mm -hmm. But once you start getting other media of exchange, such as force, then the law of supply and demand gets different beats on it, different rhythms. It may interest you to know that uh, one of the, in fact, the major question on my final examination for my science fiction course this uh, last two, two weeks ago was the um, asking the class to examine the effects of power in its various forms, abuses, and uses in two of the major works read during the semester. And uh, you, you're mentioning power just now as being the name of the game as far as Arrakis is concerned. Yeah. Huh. Uh, you see, Western man has assumed that if you have, that all you need for any problem is enough force, power. Mm -hmm. Um, and that there is no problem which won't submit to this approach. Even even the problem of our own ignorance. <laughs> 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 which, you see, throws it out the window yeah. right there. Because it's an asinine assumption. Uh -huh. uh, and it is the basic fallacy of Western man's approach to living. Now, I'm not saying that we immediately drop this and adopt Vedanta. Although that might not be a bad idea. No, we need uh, what <laughs> I would call a science of wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, I think among the things that we need, uh, and this is indicated to a certain extent in the novel, but uh, we need a clear distinction in our minds, in the minds of Western man, between the ethical norm and the moral life the moral life is subject to change, uh, it is the law, etc., etc., etc. But the ethical norm are those things which we must do because they are the proper thing to do regardless of the law. They're an abstract. They're, they are an abstract. And this conflict between the moral and the ethical norms we see obtaining in certain situations within Dune, as I recall. Well, uh, well, the moral... At least I could extrapolate. 
Yeah, uh, you, that's correct. Well, the, the moral norm, as I saw it in Dune, was something that is imposed upon people by their environment. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's as fixed as uh, uh, how many wives a man in this culture might be able to support and thereby have, or, mm -hmm. or uh, what possessions he can carry from one stopping place to another, mm -hmm. um, and how this would control the moral laws that yes. would be built up in society. We see it in our society, for example, um, out of our nomadic background and uh, herdsman background. Mm -hmm. We see all kinds of moral injunctions which grew up out of that and which we accept today, logically. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to denigrate no. them. Um, but we can trace them this way. Now this is where moral law comes from. Mm -hmm. Ethical law takes a, a step in an, another, another direction, direction. Mm -hmm. and it says that uh, uh, I, the thinking animal, see that the logical consequences of these moral actions are such and so, and maybe I better modify the moral law slightly by a higher ethical law. I find this then in one of the uh, in some of the internal conflicts which are bothering Paul, yeah. uh, that uh, the ethical norm which he sees as being an uh, one of say absolute rightness, as opposed with a the law of moral necessity, uh, and these are clashing in him. These are tensions at work within Paul, which cause him, I think, to have a depth of characterization that you do not normally find within the normal science fiction novel. You've hit on, the, of course, the, the way the character of Paul was constructed. It was a conflict between uh, absolutes and the necessity of the moment. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, It's almost an existential necessity, incidentally, as I caught it, as I read it. That's right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> now, uh, you see, this is an exercise in... Uh, showing up, you might say, the fallacy of absolutism. Mm -hmm. Even to be absolute about being non-absolute. Because Paul is, is bothered with that very problem That's at right. times. Mm -hmm. uh, how absolute can he be and yet uh, in his relationships with his subordinates, mm -hmm. with um, Stilgar, for example, yeah. if he's too absolute, he loses, you know, he, he gains a, how did you put it in the novel? He he saw. He sees the loss of a friend and the what? The gain of a worshiper, almost. I think. He gains a. Um, uh, he loses a friend. A friend and gains, gains a, a worshiper. A worshiper, yes. And this kind of conflict, which you, if he's too absolute here and non absolute there, or in the necessity, or no, when the tribe tries to force upon Paul the apparent necessity for killing Stilgar, and he has to talk the tribe out of one of their tribal rules in order a moral. to... moral. Yeah, right. A moral rule. A moral rule. And you see how the moral rule was developed out of the necessities of their yes, background. exactly. And he has given them then an ethical rule. Yes. And yet this conflict is, is continual within Paul, I, I think. And it makes, uh, I think, for certain added dimensions in the novel that, uh, again, the the normal science fiction novel does not have. Well, you began this then in, in 53, and you began doing research and filling file folders with facts and uh, extrapolating to uh, the, the sand dune planet. W uh, tell me further about the writing process itself. Well, this was the uh, first book where I really started carefully applying these ideas about the building of a rhythm within a story. Would you just define this a little bit more for me? I will. I'll be specific about it. <laughs> um, uh, and I can use a, uh, an analogy which is familiar to both of us, poetry. Right. But it is used only as an analogy. Okay. Um, you know how you choose a word in a given poem to control the beat of the poem. Are you familiar way, okay. with uh, Hopkins' poem, The Windhover? If I, not, I'll get it out for you later and show you how there is one word in there which absolutely controls the total poem. Yeah. This happens in many poems. Many poems. Yeah. That, <clears throat> and uh, the poem then develops a certain fixed rhythm. Mm -hmm. Now, by changing 
the uh, phraseology, the yeah. placement of words, you can change that rhythm. You can slow it down, mm -hmm. you can speed it up. Well, there is an analogous thing in prose. I think this is yeah. quite easily defensible. That, that uh, length of sentence, number one, uh, modifying clauses, variety of sentence structure, variety. variety of sentence structure, all of these things control the pace of controlled reading or control, uh, controlled uh, uh, silent reading or mm -hmm. uh, oral. And I work orally because I think that the language was spoken long before it was written. And I think that unconsciously we still accept it as an oral transmission. That's something I'm going to have to try with uh, some of my classes is reading parts of Dune aloud to them. Uh, I've done this, I do this as the standard device in, in when I teach Joyce or Yates or Elliot. I, I read great gobs of it aloud in the class. Well, this was done deliberately as to control that oral pace. I, by the length of sentence, by the variety of sentence, by the words in the sentence, whether long, convoluted words or short, chopping words. Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon is against uh, Latin. Latin. Mm -hmm. uh, I control the pace. So I have several rhythms built into the story deliberately. One is a long-term rhythm. Um, and we'll get to the ending of the book in a moment. I, the ending is camp. High camp. Deliberately. And a, a number of people, interestingly, have, have seen it. I wanted to say... I found it sheer action. Mm -hmm. Almost for the sake of action. Yes. And overly dramatic, maybe. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in the future they will call us wives. I said, yeah, almost. But you call it high camp. I hadn't thought of it that way. <clears throat> well, I wanted to turn the story around on itself. But in two very specific ways. And obviously, you don't limit if you do the way it turns. If you do that, even if you do one way sure. that you know of. Uh, one, I was poking a little fun at the idea of the person who always sees things verbally and must write about them and record them, you know, uh, the, the historicity of anything that happens. You see, you're not living it, you're recording it. Yeah. Is it? This is what we're doing right now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> The man uh, who never sees anything except through his camera. Yeah, but we're having a good Say that again, please. The man who never sees anything except through his camera viewer. Uh -huh. He sees the whole world, you see, him just through that little square ball. The viewfinder. Right. Yeah. So I wanted to, to kind of have a little snicker about this, you see, mm -hmm. right at the end. And <clears throat> a, you detected that sheer action treatment there. Mm -hmm. And you see how that this does what I'm describing. Yes. <laughs> Because and that is a limited point of view, actually, the sheer action treatment. Yeah, uh -huh. that's right. And um, also, by making it a man-to-man uh, uh, -man battle mm -hmm. at that point between Paul, who is a, an extremely complex character, yeah. and uh, this almost stick figure, Black, you see. Mm -hmm. Who is sort of, uh, in many ways, Paul's counterpart. Exactly. Uh, he's, mm -hmm. a, he's a foil in the classic sense of the word. A foil, foil. in the classic sense yeah. in other places. Right. But at this point, he becomes uh, that, that impossible thing, that non-existent thing, the absolute evil. Yeah. You mm -hmm. see? And so we turn the whole thing whirling backward through the story. Mm -hmm. There was another thing there. <clears throat> In the pacing of the story, it was very slow at the beginning. It's a coital rhythm all the way through the story. It's a what? A coital rhythm. Okay. Very slow. Pace increasing all the way through. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the ending of it, I've chopped it at a, uh, at a non-breaking point so that the person reading the story skids out of the story, trailing bits of it with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, on this, I know I was successful because people uh, come to me and say uh, they want more. And I have said this to my classes that, in many ways, as satisfying as Dune is, I find it unsatisfying because there are so many uh, unanswered questions. You don't tie up the loose ends of, say, Paul's sister, uh, unless you read uh, 
what is the huntress of a, of a thousand worlds <laughs> that marvelous little little footnote <laughs> uh, princess alia uh, but uh, or um, several other things the the whole question of the spacing guild yeah. itself and how it got to be the way it was is a uh, uh, is handled very you know well let's let's examine something as far as fiction in general is right. concerned <clears throat> um, now there are other reasons why stories are remembered and I'm talking about story in the classic sense of the of the uh, jongleur who goes from castle to castle to earn his meal all right entertainment sure. <clears throat> the stories that are remembered are the ones that strike sparks from your mind mm -hmm. one way or another it's mm -hmm. like a grinding wheel they touch you and sparks fly. Whether this be something like the Miller's Tale of Chaucer or uh, Sir Gawain and the Grena Knicht, if yes, you please. Yes, indeed. Uh, or, uh, well, we could uh, adduce thousands of other examples up to, say, Treasure Island or, or what you will. There's sparks there. Okay? I understand now, your term. Now, we all have stories that we go on with after finishing reading them. Mm -hmm. Uh... As children, we can remember playing Treasure Island. Right. Or playing Tom Sawyer. Or Tom Sawyer. Mm -hmm. Any of these. We remember playing these. The story stayed with us. The characters and their conflicts and their joys, their play, mm -hmm. all stayed with us. And it enkindled sparks in our own imagination so that we the developed. Basic, we, told, we, we were then active in creative play. That's exactly right. We went on and told the story ourselves. Yeah. Now, I deliberately did this in Dune for that purpose. I want the person to go on and construct for himself all of these marvelous flights of fantasy and imagination. Mm -hmm. I want him to... to uh, you see, you, you haven't had the Spacing Guild explained completely just enough so that you know its existence. Mm -hmm. Now, with lots of people, they've got to complete this. Yes. So they build it up in their own minds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, this is right out of the story, though, you see. Yeah. Or the whole... The sparks uh, have flown. Bene Gesserit, you pronounce it? Bene Gesserit, yeah. Bene Gesserit. The, their whole uh, mystique and uh, so on is uh, relatively unexplained. Why do they want the Kwisatz Haderach in the first place, you see, is uh, relatively... The name of the game is power. Yeah. And they want power. Hmm? That that explains it to a certain extent, but uh, they want power in a specific way. <clears throat> you know, I've always been amazed by the statement or by the label of um, psychological warfare. There could be no such thing as psychological warfare if you develop a psychological weapon sufficiently that it is destructive to any potential enemy it will destroy you with the enemy it's a two-edged sword without a handle and if you grab it hard enough to wield it you're going it's to be self-destructive yes hmm. so we could have a, ver a variation on the Lord Acton notion power corrupts both the user and the receiver of the power, both, absolutely. Right. Uh-huh. Acton saw it. Yeah. How interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of the who power corrupts. In now, the Bene Gesserit see this. Mm -hmm. You see how they keep themselves in the background. Yes, that's true. They want a user of power they can control. Mm -hmm. I see. With safety to them. That's right. It's a I safety see. device, you see. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and I, I say this in, in several ways, not in this way. Yeah. Not in this blatant, you know, way, but implying it with all of its uh, permutations, because there's much more to this. We could go on for several hours discussing this aspect of yeah. it. Yeah, the whole uh, attitude of uh, Reverend Mother Gaius uh, Moyam. Uh, yeah. For example, Helen Gaius Moyam. Um, yes, I see how we could various aspects of it. Well, I, I'd like to uh, 
I'd like to examine this a little bit further in some of the religious constructs. Before we get into that, okay. let me tell you something. Uh, I was up at Sonoma State uh, last month to talk to a class up there. And <clears throat> the question that seemed to uh, attract the most attention from the class, somebody asked back there, uh, what's all this nonsense about controlling people with voice? <laughs> oh. And there seemed to be a lot of agreement with this point of view, that it's impossible to do this. And so <laughs> I said, we do it all the time. Of course we do. <laughs> and it's amazing to me that anybody could even begin to question this as a, as a, an, uh, as a fact of our existence. And they couldn't see it. So I said, well, I'll give you an example. I'm going to describe a man to you. You know this man. And I'm going to give you a task of controlling him by voice after I've described him and after you recognize him. I said, this is a man who was in World War I as a sergeant, came home from World War I to his small town in the Midwest, married his childhood sweetheart and went into his father's business, raised two children whom he didn't understand and they don't understand him. He joined the VFW and the Legion, went on every picnic, every convention, lived by the double standard, mm -hmm. he thought. Now, on the telephone, strictly by voice, I want you to make him mad. <laughs> <laughs> oink, oink, oink. <laughs> Any one of a, of a hundred <coughs> variations. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, Certain. simplest thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> now, what we're seeing here is that. Uh, see, I've I've drawn a gross caricature. Of course, course. but <clears throat> but we're saying that if you know the individual well enough, if you know the subtleties of his strengths and weaknesses, that merely by the way you cast your voice, by the words you select. By the intonations. Whatever. Whatever. Yeah. Right. You can control him. Now, if you can do it in a gross way, obviously, with refinement, you can do it in much more subtle fashion. And it's done all the time in politics. And this is one of the techniques, incidentally, that science fiction, I think, does. It takes a possibility or something that does actually exist today and extrapolates from that, perhaps refines it, makes it more specific. The science of control by voice. Yeah, Isn't there exactly. there a word in semantics for these uh, messages that we get across? What it was a, a meta, uh, meta message. Yeah, meta message. Meta message. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, it's a well recognized uh, thing in semantics, and, and you see it. Hayakawa uses the example of um, <clears throat> you're talking, you've met somebody mm -hmm. uh, for the first time, maybe in a business meeting at a convention, and you get acquainted and you're speaking, you exchange views. At the end of it, uh, you say, uh, we must get together for lunch sometime. Now, under one example of this, the fellow will call you the next week or you'll call him and you will get together for lunch. And he knows you're, he's supposed to call you and, and make this luncheon date. Under the other example of this same phrase, he knows that this is goodbye, I don't care to talk to you anymore. But it's the same phrase. Mm -hmm. And they're both polite. And they're both polite. Oh, yes. And this is the meta message. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The hidden message underneath the message and yeah, so that's on. Right. Yeah, I can understand that. Well, I had, I had no trouble understanding that question of the voice as I read the novel because among the other things which the novel uh, gave to me was the whole question of communication and how we communicate on m multiple levels, whether it be uh, Paul communicating by shedding a tear, that's an act of communication, uh, on a very profound level to the Freeman, but um, whether or the communication of the voice or the communication by sword or the communication by a dozen different ways that we all do constantly, as we're doing in this room right now, so you're communicating by, in one sense by the way you you're both watching me as I speak and 
uh, watching Frank and watching the recorder and watching what you're doing with your hands. They're all sorts of communications, just as I'm communicating and you are in a dozen, hundreds of hidden different ways. I had no problem with that in the novel, and I thought it was rather well done. Um, let me go off on another parenthesis here. Uh, did you ever read the novel uh, Nostromo by Conrad? No. I was reminded very much as I read um, Dune for the first time of the reaction that I had when I first read Nostromo. I think that Nostromo is uh, one of, if probably Conrad's greatest novel, his, certainly his most artistic achievement as well as his most profound and I found myself thinking about Nostromo as I read uh, as I read Dune. Now I'm going to have to read it. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean that's very high praise mm -hmm. because Nostromo is ultimately the creation of an entire universe. It is the country of Costaguana in Central America. There is one thing in Central in this country of Costaguana that influences everybody, and it is the presence of a gigantic silver mine. And the silver corrupts oh. everybody in the country <coughs> in I... one way or another. Mm -hmm. It can corrupts the British people who are running the silver mine. It corrupts the incorruptible Nostromo, our man, mm -hmm. who is the sort of a folk hero of the thing. Yeah. It corrupts everybody. It totally controls the country and in watching how these people interrelate to the problem of, of a silver mine. Mm -hmm. And the parallels there, you see, between Dune and Nostromo, to me as I read it as a professor of English, were, were very strong. Uh, and this is one of the things I object to in, among my own compatriots, is that they are unable to see that something like Nostromo is in a very real sense a type of science fiction. We have created a mythical country based upon reality, yeah. uh, where the people react in certain ways to things which we would react to in, in other ways, but it's said over here, just as the freemen react to... Oh yes, it's my contention yeah. that in, um, especially in Dune, and, and Dune is an, uh, an exposition of this point, mm -hmm. that Man himself is going to change. We have changed. But our changes, the, the actual basic change, is a gradual climb. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't see this as progress. I see it as a, a sort of entropy and as a, a growth of complexity. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but that this is such a slow process that in thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years, we would still recognize the emotions, the reactions, all of these things. And given any set of forces which you can delineate, mm -hmm. the silver mine, mm -hmm. uh, the geriatric spice, right. the uh, existence of certain hard lines of power control and communication, as perhaps oversimplified by, say, the Harkonnens versus the Atreides yes. uh, families. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you have a, a classical feudal yeah, system sure. here. Uh, it's my contention that feudalism is a natural condition of human beings. Not that it is the only condition, <coughs> not that it is the right condition, that it is just a way we have of falling into organizations. I like to use the example of the uh, Berlin Museum beavers. You ever come across this? No. Well, my f the numbers are going to be wrong here, but it's on this order. Yeah. Um, before World War II, there were uh, a number of families of beaver in the Berlin Museum. They were European beaver. Uh, they had been in there, raised in captivity, for something on the order of 70 beaver generations, in cages. Mm -hmm. World War II came along and a bomb freed some of them into the countryside. What did they do? They went out and they started building dams. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, <coughs> 
uh, tribal organization. Feudalism is tribal organization. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I'm talking about. So uh, tribal organization is a natural organization of humankind. Mm -hmm. We tend to fall into it, given any chance at all, given the proper stresses or given the proper lack of stresses. And I think we could extrapolate from that notion and say we have many more feudal or tribal aspects in our society than we might have otherwise thought about it. I would think that the existence of the Roman Catholic Church in its feudal state, as long as it has existed, is sort of proof of what you're saying. The hippies are a proof of it. Uh, Look yes. at the organization they set up. It's a tribal organization. Yeah, a business office is feudal. Yeah. No, a company is feudal. Mm -hmm. A university, perhaps? Oh, yes, indeed. An, an English department. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Well, uh, of course, what we're doing here is oversimplifying. Yes. The, the complexities of it and the variations on the theme are multitude. Mm -hmm. But the, the framework is there. The skeleton is there. And you can recognize that skeleton. Mm -hmm. So... I set up the situation in Doom where the natural evolvement was a classic feudalism. Mm -hmm. And for a very specific purpose, I wanted the lines of power to be clear. Yeah. At the same time, feudal lines of power were extremely, uh, were extremely complicated. I don't oh, mean yeah. to contradict you, but... No, I, I they, understand by, what you're saying. Uh, That's why I said simple, the... they were nonetheless uh, multi-leveled. Yes. Uh, as you indicate with uh, uh, Baron Harkonnen yes. and the Nabaron and, and, and so on, all of these things of, of the relationship to the Imperium, uh, this, you want to go back to the 14th, thir no, 14th century in England, the War of the Roses. No, by example. clear, in this, I meant in this sense, recognizable by anybody who knows, knows the first damn right. thing about history. Precisely. The mm -hmm. thief uh, is a set of obligations from top to bottom and from bottom to top, mutual yeah. back and forth, ultimately. Yeah, it, it, it's a feedback situation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And this kind of, of thing, the kind of loyalty that, say, Gurney Halleck gave Paul, yeah. or gave Paul's father, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that you... The loyalty to the family. Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I am the rightful Duke of... Atreides, yes. at the very end of the thing, mm -hmm. not, as he is speaking to the Sardaukar, do you yes, pronounce it? the Sardaukar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. I know my students have had a lot of fun tracing down the uh, background of the Freeman as far back as they can from the hints you drop in the novel, mm -hmm. um, and coming to the surprise, uh, delighted surprise, that they were once probably uh, on Seleucus Secundus, uh, and that this accounts for part of the way they are, even the hardening there. And further, uh, uh, the uh, tracing the life cycle of Shai Alud is really an interesting thing for them, uh, because you don't quite complete the whole thing in your uh, in the appendices. Of course, what have I set up there? <clears throat> we know uh, our information about the cyclic nature the interdependence yeah. of our own environment is still quite sketchy in many areas. But we do know this. We know that you need to create large bodies of sand, dust, and whatnot. Yeah. You need water action. Some, anyway. Yeah. Uh, and so I've set up multitudes of creatures who substitute for this. Yeah. Quite logical. Yeah. Why they, not? They do this. Uh, and I've postulated that in one vector of their life circle, water is poison to them. Right. We see this uh, sort of thing on planet Earth right now, where uh, a creature can live in one environment, in one vector, but that environment will kill it in another vector. Mm -hmm. The Anopheles mosquito is a good example. <laughs> and it doesn't take much of a stretch of the imagination to carry this further in that classic science fiction way, saying that given other circumstances, 
right. on another planet, a creature could develop something that we could see was analogous to this, mm -hmm. and but would do these other things. Now, there's another element of Shai Halud too. Shai Halud serves a specific function, among other things in the story, but a specific leitmotif function. All right. It's the unthinking beast. It's the black beast. It's the the personification of the bull in the arena. Not the way the bull in the arena actually is, but the personification. The mystique of the back. The mystique of it, and it's there it is. I never took... The black beast has connotations that I never gave it. Maybe it's my, my taking it wrong from your terminology. Uh, it's the... Uh, the mythic beast, the, the uh, it's the archetypal beast. Is that the what archetypal you mean? Beast. Is that now what you mean by black beast? That's right. Now bring this okay. up because of your mention earlier of, of the uh, tracing the archetypal backgrounds. In yeah, um, and the, it, I meant it classically. The archetypal black beast, mm -hmm. the one that lives underground mm -hmm. in the cavern with the gold. I see. Okay, right. See? Well, this is the dragon of Beowulf who lives in a cave. Yeah. Guarding with gold. the golden dagger. Right, precisely. Mm -hmm. uh, incidentally, Frank Baum used the, uh, the in one of his Oz books, used the uh, dragon guard, uh, hoarding gold, guarding gold, believe it or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, this, th that was why yeah. I put this in there. Mm -hmm. It's a familiar theme. And the gold, of course, becomes the geriatric spice. That's in, right. In another yeah. sense. Which I once figured out, and one of my students figured out, that the geriatric spice itself is probably the defecated matter of Shia <laughs> In one of its vectors. <laughs> or, or it might have been, no, not, not in defecated matter, but also, no, no, it was um, the eggs, perhaps, waiting, <laughs> and that's why they're guarded, among other things. Look at the value of that corner. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. well, true. They have lots of, you of know, kids have lots of fun with this. Of course, the, yeah, and, and I did that deliberately. Sure. The, the value of a good story in the entertainment sense is how much of this it tips off, yeah. how much it starts rolling, sure. so that you start creating your own story. Sure. Mm -hmm. The one that's in all of us, you see. And um, in that sense, there is no right answer to um, the final, let's say, complete life cycle of Shia Lund. Yeah, do you want me to pin it down for you? I can. I mean, I had it in mind. You had it in mind? Yeah, but... Uh, I had it worked out too. Let's uh, let's compare notes. Well, I'd be interested before I say anything to hear what you have to say. I got to get my book. I'm going to turn okay. this off for a minute. Now we're back again. <clears throat> um, we were talking about the archetypal patterns in Dune for a moment. Off on this tangent now. Well, we got onto the sequel for a moment. Yeah. And there's a point here that I think should be made. <clears throat> Campbell turned down the sequel. Hmm. Now, his argument was that I had created an anti-hero in Paul in the sequel. Mm -hmm. And he has built his magazine. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, grossly oversimplifying, sure. but this is the essence of it, really, and truthfully uh, accurate. Yeah. That uh, he had built his magazine on the hero. Now, it's my contention that the difference between a hero and an anti-hero it's where you stop the story. And if you're true to life, <coughs> if you're true to life, giving the, these ingredients, then the story goes on because human beings go on. Now you can confine your story to one individual. And therefore, as far as he's concerned, the story begins with birth and ends with death. Mm -hmm. But if you're dealing with larger movements, it, the parameters are much broader. That's right, as they much are in this book. Yeah. Then there is no real ending. It's just a place where you stop the story. And one of the reasons, by the way, why in the book Dune, I stop it the way I do. Deliberately building up a carrying momentum as though you were going down a slide mm -hmm. and then just chopping it to a moment of triumph and then that's it and you skid out of the story yeah. mm -hmm. with all of this clinging to you yeah. mm -hmm. 
I can see that, yeah. But as I understand the uh, Jungian archetypal pattern, you know, the Lord Raglan yeah. steps of the hero, I, uh, Dune takes up about the first 15 of them, more or less, and if uh, uh, I know nothing about the sequel, uh, other than the few words you've told me, but I would be willing to predict that uh, if you follow the pattern, uh, the archetypal hero pattern, he goes through many of the things that uh, Lord Raglan sets out in the, the uh, in the notion of the hero and the quest hero. Uh, ultimately, some Paul has to die. It's a question of how and uh, uh, under what circumstances, and uh, uh, probably uh, as a result of some of these tensions which have been previously operating. Yes, several of them, and one of them, of course, is the tension of prognostication, yeah. prediction. <clears throat> this is foreshadowed in here. Yeah. He, he never sees his own death moment, but he's always concerned about it. Yeah. We bring this, that's right, we bring this to a head. Uh, <clears throat> this idea that I'm expounding, that, you know, when you talk to a, any of the average individual and he says, oh, God, if I could only know everything that's going to happen tomorrow, wouldn't that be wonderful? Oh, what he is talking about is the fifth race at Hialeah. Yeah. Or will that girl say yes or no? <laughs> That's right. That's what he's talking about. And he doesn't really want to know everything that's going to happen tomorrow. Because this is precisely what I do to Paul. Mm -hmm. um, we carry this to its logical outcome. And we reach a point in the sequel where he is physically blinded, is without sight. I think this is what set Campbell off on the side. Oh, becomes an anti-hero in that sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, but he, here is Paul, he's physically blinded, and yet he knows everything, everything that's going to happen. He's lived this one before. Well, think of how boring that is, but think of how mysterious and terrifying it would be to everybody people. else. Sure. Yes. A guy, it would be as though uh, I, without sight, you could see, I have nothing but a couple of sockets here. And my wife comes in and picks up a, a cigarette out of a package. I lean over and light it for her. And say it's a Paul Mall. Yes. <laughs> say, you, oh, you're back to Paul Mall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Paul does such things as grabbing a, uh, uh, a microphone out of a, uh, a trooper's hands and relaying orders immediately after the accident, which his eyes are lost. <clears throat> and uh, greeting people in the hallway as he passes them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> The, um, well, and of course, it builds up this terrifying uh, this godhead among the people around him, but it also foreshadows their turning against him, because yeah. if a person really does this sort of thing to you, you're going to get away from him one way or another. They crucify him. Yeah. In, in, in <laughs> many ways, they would. I, would, I, could, I could see this, and uh, this would lead us uh, to uh, all sorts of possible uh, symbolic interpretations of... of um, knowledge and, and so on, going back yeah. to the Oedipal notion. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my contention, of And I've always wondered about the Oedipal aspects of the... Uh, oh, they're the, there. The, ...the novel, but let's not go into that right yeah. now. <laughs> they're, they're there and deliberately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the... Uh, um, no, I, it's my contention, I, I think I'm probably right on this, that the thing that got to Campbell was not that I had an anti-hero in this sense, but that I had destroyed one of his gods. Oh. See, because prediction and esp. Oh, of course. With Campbell, that's, you know, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. You see, if you know the, the magazine and his right. editorial. Sure. I've been reading right. it since 1940. All right. Then you know that he he is completely devoted to this idea. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm not uh, arguing against him, but I'm merely yeah. saying that this is his point of view. And this pokes a great deal of fun at Not so much fun as it pokes a big hole in the whole theory. That, and, yes, that it would be great to know everything that's going to happen tomorrow. And so he rejected it. Huh? And so he rejected it. Isn't that interesting? But Galaxy snapped it right up and yeah. paid Campbell's rates. Huh. Well, 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 well. Looking for another nebula for that one? <laughs> I don't know. I, I didn't even look for a nebula for the first one. I didn't write it with that in mind. Uh -huh. I, I, my chief concern is to tell a good story. Yeah. It really is. Virginia Heinlein says that uh, every time that Bob wanders away, she says, cut to the chase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard them say that. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> this is a 
classic Hollywood approach. Yeah. It? Well, could we go back a little bit and tell us more about the uh, the, the novel as it uh, developed in your mind? Well, you were going to, to uh, do something. Oh, I was going to trace Shai Halud for you. Well, uh, I, I can't quite do it completely without referring to the text, and I'm afraid that uh, most of it is given in the text, but I think that... Uh, uh, the, the the question of the sand trout and the uh, right. uh, is is one of the vectors mm -hmm. from the sand trout to the dry leathery to the, to the sand trout no dry leathery thing sand trout to little maker mm -hmm. to a to the to, to the worm to the big one to the yes well but the, the, it goes through. Does Little Maker just go directly into the worm, or is there another? No, no that's, it goes directly. directly it grows. Into it's a the matter worm. of growth process from growth, there. All right, to to the to Shihalud itself, and then Shihalud spice, I think, becomes the eggs. Well, the spice, as I conceived, the spice or, as I conceived it was necessary for the uh, uh, development from, let's say, the pupil stage. Yeah. To, to go beyond the pupil stage. They, they had to uh, have be in the presence of the spice. Well, that's the way I conceived it. I see. Mm -hmm. I that's think the why spice it's so itself is almost as being spermatic material. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's and right. And then exactly the spice right. growing into the well, ultimately little maker, mm -hmm. as I saw it. Is that something like royal honey, royal nectar? No, the way I saw it is slightly different, but. Uh, <coughs> The spice in the presence of a uh, of a dead oh worm yes who killed by the water of life that's then right. this becomes uh, and you're off in the spice blow that's right, right. this becomes okay. yeah. the mm -hmm. seed of the new life cycle yeah mm -hmm. it's uh, almost orgasmic in that sense that's right yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. probably deliberately so yeah okay. it's, it, I I built mm -hmm. these things in there yeah. deliberately all the way through it yeah. How oh, interesting. Well, if we can go back then and talk about uh, a little bit more about the uh, uh, formation of the novel from, say, 1953 and the germinal ideas and your uh, file folders and so on. Uh, we were up to, up to about there a little while, a while ago. Well, I'm not too clear on dates or anything. Dates, yeah. but they, they don't concern me. I, no. I'm more involved with the actual... Well, piece of long, paper in front of you. All right. How long a writing process uh, did this take then, uh, from the time you this began till the time you the were actual finished? physical writing process? Mm -hmm. uh, about two years. About two years. Mm -hmm. and you wrote it uh, in, when you were in Mexico. No. Oh. I wrote it here. Wrote it here. Mm -hmm. um, but I had the idea with me in Mexico was adding to it. You see, you were talking about two different things here. The accumulation of data, data and the physical writing and process. the physical right. sitting down in front of the paper and actually putting a story down mm -hmm. uh, it's almost as though you're filling a container I see uh, that has been pretty well built up at that yeah. time uh, it's interesting uh, Harry Harrison uh, describes the writing process with him rather well in a tape I made with him a few months ago uh, he is absolutely uh, uninterruptible from, say, 12.30 in the afternoon until 5 o'clock at night uh, because the ideas, as they form in his mind, sort of become into the extensions of his <coughs> excuse me, fingers in the typewriter mm -hmm. and that they are up here and that, the <clears throat> and that any interruption, whether it be a telephone mm -hmm. ringing or his wife knocking at the door or anything at all, is liable to shatter that idea as it transforms itself into paper. This is a very evanescent thing. Yeah. Very. And uh, uh, I have to fight this. But uh, Bev is very nice to me about this. She keeps the... A writer's children are uh, always... They learn to tiptoe and is daddy writing. Mm -hmm. In fact, you don't have to say be quiet. You say your father is writing in silence. Uh -huh. What is your uh, writing schedule? Well, it varies. Um, depends on what I'm doing writing for the magazine mm -hmm. down here. <clears throat> but as a general rule, it goes like this. I'll get home somewhere around 5 o'clock. 
Uh, when Bev is here, when she's not working, as she has been the last couple of weeks, uh, she'll have dinner ready at that time. Or very close to that time. I'll then take an hour's nap and then work sometimes till one o'clock in the morning. Then I hit the sack and get up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, if the story is strong in me, I get up in the morning and write. Mm -hmm. Get up at five o'clock in the morning or so and, and write for an hour or two sometimes before going down to, to San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, and this is the thing I want to get out of because um, I can write eight hours a day in two bursts. And I don't see any reason why I shouldn't be doing what I want, writing what I want to write during those times. I don't envision um, supporting myself entirely by science fiction writing in the sense of writing only science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, because I have other access to grind too. Yeah. I'm going to do a, a, a non-fiction book on air pollution, for example. I'm really hipped on this ecology thing. The consequences of some of the things that we're doing to our planet. And I don't mean in the uh, uh, lock it up and throw it away sense of the uh, classic uh, conservationist. In other words, turn it all into wilderness. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that. But there are ways of living with our planet, not against it. And this is the attitude that we have to develop. And it is an attitude. Thank you, Mr. Keynes. <laughs> Pardon, Keynes. No, it is an attitude. Sure. It's, yeah. it's, it's something that has to be uh, ingrained into us as children. As my wife is fond of telling my children, a fountain pen is not a screwdriver. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and each has its own purpose for whatever it may be. And if you misuse that thing, uh, it will turn around and bite you. You'll ruin a screwdriver or ruin a, a fountain pen in trying to make it work like a screwdriver. And we're rapidly ruining our air, our water, our planet. I found that uh, you were talking about the economics of writing and selling. Dune has made made us at this point about fifteen thousand dollars since the first sale. This includes the sale of what was it? Something like eight chapters to Campbell. That's right. Uh, by the way, uh, I did not read it in, in analog. Mm -hmm. I read it first in book form. How much of it did appear in in uh, almost all? Of almost it. all of it. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, uh, in one sense, a little more, because there were uh, uh, capsule uh, recapitulations, the synopses. To begin. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Did you write those? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. um, the, the way it, it comes in, I have found, and this is broad, for a novel, it makes somewhere between five and seven thousand dollars on the in the first twelve months of sale, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this depends on how far you sell it, how many times you sell it. Mm -hmm. Then I found that with my own work, it'll go on earning uh, for a long time. We received uh, oh several hundred dollars out of uh, uh, Dragon in the Sea this last year. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dragon. Yeah, it's still one of my Shining favorites. Long. Yeah, still one of my favorites. Well, it's still selling. Yeah. Selling in beautifully in Japan. Hmm. I understand uh, that uh, you speak Japanese. No. No? Where did I hear that? No, I uh, I don't speak Japanese. I can read a bit of ideogram. Asso desu ka. Asso desu ka. Hi. <laughs> but uh, um, I was raised with uh, Japanese Americans in the Pacific Northwest, uh -huh. in a, an area where there were a great many of them, yeah. let's put it that way. Uh, a place called Fife, between Seattle and Tacoma. Mm -hmm. And that's up near glorious Tumwater. <laughs> yes, it's north of Tumwater. <laughs> ah, an only fan. <laughs> Uh, if I'd known, I would have brought in a mess of beer. So, by the way, we have another wine in there, would you like? Uh, no, I'm going to stick to coffee for a while, okay. thanks. Um, I'll be up all night reading, but then what difference does it make? Well, anyway, I was raised with them, and uh, 
eat in Japanese, mm -hmm. and I know a few phrases. Yeah. Uh, I learned uh, quite a... Well, we were speaking of uh, <clears throat> your writing plans uh, for the future. You say the sequel to Dune will be out this fall sometime? Or earlier. Or earlier. Yeah. Uh, possibly in October, possibly earlier. There's a some question. <clears throat> uh, I requested that it be uh, moved up a bit, and I'm not sure that uh, everyone's in agreement. And maybe that's best. I mean, I'm not. Uh, you know. I just thought it would be a better idea for several reasons so that they publish it earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons is that I have built a Dune Tarot into the sequel. I'll do that one again. You know what the tarot deck is? Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, oh, I missed that. Yeah. And I, I built a Dune Tarot into it. And that's hot right now. Yeah. And I was just thinking economically, they ought to capitalize on it. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Why not? Mm -hmm. A Dune Tarot, well. See, I teach uh, Yeats and Eliot and so on. So I'm yeah. Yeah. very You're familiar very familiar. with the tarot. Yeah. Right. Well, <coughs> in fact, I, I own my own private deck. And we have one. Yeah. It's, it's my contention that if you immerse a society in a great deal of what we call fortune telling, you know, mm -hmm. that you cloud the whole process. Hmm. See, what happened in yeah. classic times, in, in Greek uh, uh, historic times, when the oracle was uh, had terrifying accuracy? The Oedipus cycle, for example. Now, there weren't a lot of, of oracles around. You went to Delphi. Delphi, right. Or to the local madman. Yeah. We looked <clears throat> at the birds and cast a few auguries here and there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And who uh, might have might kill a chicken and look at the entrails. Or note which way the blood spurts from the yes, neck as you cut it that's off. right. Yeah. Uh, any one of these methods, which I call ignition principles as far as uh, uh, prediction is concerned. See, I contend that there is such a thing, that you can do it. Whether you do it by, um, oh, a subliminal thing, Petit perception, <clears throat> or whether it is a. Uh, you uh, use the petit perception in uh, that scene in the conservatory, incidentally. I thought it was work rather well done. Mm -hmm. uh, with um, Countess Fenring? That's right. And leaving that uh, thing for Lady Jessica to pick up. End parenthesis. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's, <clears throat> well, whether our predictive faculties uh, are prophecy. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've had our profits, is a product of uh, uh, an accumulation, in the sense of a computer's accumulating data, yeah. or uh, something mystical in the sense that it's unexplained, mm -hmm. thus far unexplained. I'm looking at it through Western eyes now, as you can undoubtedly see, that, that is that it's a mechanical scientific principle, and if you get enough data to bear on it, you'll understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> now, this doesn't necessarily follow, of course, that we can understand everything in the universe. Ask me about the basic, what I think is the basic fallacy in science. The, the All right, <laughs> what is the basic fallacy in science? Tell us, pray tell. <laughs> you want a prognostication? Okay. <laughs> you know, I think, I think it's the idea that we can invent, of course, science fiction is based on this. The idea that we, that we can invent anything we imagine, and having invented it, we must use it, and then live by the consequences of it. Exactly. Yeah. Now this is the Western. See, this is the Western fallacy, mm -hmm. and this is one of the great things about the East that it does not. Uh, so of course we frown on it yeah. because they achieve their ignition by by methods that we can see are hogwash. Right, and or we misinterpret their methods. For example, if we were to consider, um, say, the tantric yoga, mm -hmm. all we would think of is that you know ah they're achieving nirvana by means of sex, and it's much more than that. 
Yeah. For uh, as one specific example, we we take only one aspect of it and make sort of an end out of it. Or hell, man, you go back to the the uh, slitting the neck of the chicken and watching which way the blood spurts. Yeah. Uh, you see, you you see what I'm saying by ignition. Uh huh. This ignites a. Uh, you see, you have to have confidence that you can do it. You have to believe you can do it. And believing you can do it, the process is ignited by any one of a million methods. Mm -hmm. We've experimented with many. Mm -hmm. The direction the birds fly or, or any of this, you see. Well, I had a student a few years ago who's, whose wife uh, was so accurate with the tarot deck that uh, she stopped using it completely. I must tell you She something. frightened herself. I terrified a gal one time when we, I was about 17. We were uh, sitting in a in her aunt's house, and her aunt and an uncle were out of sight, but within hearing distance, and down in some stacks in their library, which was nearby. And we were sitting across them from each other on hassocks, in the mouth of a fireplace, a big stone fireplace between us, with a, down to embers. And we'd been out on a date, and I'd brought her home. And we didn't have anything going. We, she was just a a gal I knew. I happened to have had a crush on her younger sister, and, <laughs> and she knew it. <laughs> and uh, uh, unrequited love at 17 is a hideous thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Anyway, uh, that was a, there was a great upsurge of Rhine consciousness at the time, yeah. predicting the cards. Of course, our interpretation of predicting the cards was, you know, we only knew one kind of cards. It was a deck of cards. Sure. So she broke out a brand new deck of cards and shuffled them. We'd been talking about it on the way home. And <clears throat> quite shadowy in the room. There was the firelight and a, uh, Pat was sitting across the fireplace and the light from where uh, her aunt and uncle were playing cribbage in the back in there. Both of them deaf, by the way. And you could hear this, 15-2 and 2 is 4. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Coming Paris, back six. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, there was a light from back in there, so she could see the cards. And she said, see if you can predict the cards. She'd been shuffling them, you see. So she picked up the first card. And I closed my eyes, and I saw that card. So I told her, and that was it. She put it down. That was the card. I swear to you, Will, I went through that entire deck mm. predicting every card that she was going to see, and there wasn't a failure at all. I told her every card, and I did it the same way every time. Now, whether I saw a reflection in her eyes, in other words, we go back to yeah. Petit Perception, yeah. or whether this was some actual keyed-in transmission. We were uh, simpatico, or mm -hmm. some, something. Uh, Tuned in on her wavelength. Empathy was yeah. uh, uh, rampant in this yeah. atmosphere. Uh, I don't know what it was, but I predicted what the cards were. And I said, my goodness, I said, this is fascinating. Let's do it again. Shuffle them again. So she shuffled the deck again and cut them a few times and we started going through them again. Hmm. And uh, we got down old five or six cards into the deck and suddenly she threw the whole deck down on the heart of the fireplace and said, this scares me. I don't want to do this anymore. Hmm. Have you ever had that kind of success? Uh, never, rather? never again. Hmm. But it was a... Uh, uh, the odds against being able to do this by uh, anything but uh, some unrecognized force. contact or force. I, I'm not r ruling out the fact that I may have seen, she wasn't wearing glasses, but the light may have been such that without even sure. recognizing it, I saw them or a reflection of them in her eyes or something of that nature. Uh, this is possible. There are more things twixt heaven and earth for ratio than are dreamt of. Oh, philosophy. oh, Will! <laughs> <laughs> well, you rather expect things like that from an English teacher, don't you? Um, not frequently. Not frequently. Uh, I'd like to ask a couple of more questions. <coughs> I wanted to talk about the religious constructs behind uh, uh, <clears throat> the novel. It's obvious that some of the Arabian mystique is there. Yes. Um, and I think any perceptive reader can pick this up. But <clears throat> part of the question relates to the uh, identity of Paul as, a, as an avatar, as a new messiah, right. uh, or as a new prophet, or what you will. Uh, would you care to talk about that a little? Well, one of, the, one of the threads in the story is 
to trace a possible way a messiah is created in our society. And I hope I was successful in, in making it believable that here we have the entire process, or at least the, the large uh, and, and some of the subtle elements of the construction of this, both from the individual standpoint and from the, the way society demands this of him. It's the reference in there, you know, that, that the man must recognize the myth he's living in. Uh, because the creation of an avatar is a myth-making process. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done it in, our, in recent times. Look at what's happening to John F. Kennedy, oh, sure. who was a very earthy, real, oh, yes. and uh, not totally holy man. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, so here we have a, a, a likable person now, you see. Yeah. But real in the flesh and blood sense who, by the process of immolation, mm -hmm. becomes something larger than life, far larger than life. Mm -hmm. Well, and I've just explored all of, uh, as many permutations yeah. as I could recognize in the process. Well, I, I caught overtones of Lawrence of Arabia in the thing, uh, for example. He could very well have become an avatar yeah. for, the, uh, for the Arabs. Right. If Lawrence of Arabia had died uh, at the crucial moment of uh, the uh, British... Uh, Say, when Allenby walked into Jerusalem. Yeah, if he had died, if, if for example, he had gone up and killed uh, uh, the people who were destroying his dream, yeah. walked into that conference and said, uh, uh -huh. gentlemen, I have here under my jebala a surprise, bang, 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 and he had been killed. Ah, he'd have been deified. He would have been deified. And the, it would have been the most terrifying thing the British had ever encountered. Because the Arabs would have swept that entire peninsula with that sort of force behind them. One of the things we've done in our society is exploited this power, Western man. Has exploited this avatar power. Um, well, if I could ask then one more question along this same line. You mentioned a little bit earlier that you studied comparative religion at one time or were right. a student of it. Uh, was it from your experience in uh, reading in comparative religions that uh, brought you to this <coughs> particular notion of an avatar? That was part of it. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was ignited by the, idea of, by the ideas that I encountered in reading about desert societies. Yeah. And I think that the idea of the way Western society has exploited this force, we have, you know, yeah. we've used it as a, quite consciously. Mm -hmm. We've sent out our missionaries and, oh, uh, yeah. to do our dirty work for us, um, and then come along behind them with the certain belief that we are right in anything that we do. Right. right. But because God has told us so. Yeah. God in the person of the avatar. Well, one, one last personal question then, uh, if, uh, one last personal question then, if you don't mind, uh, do you profess any specific uh, religion yourself? You mentioned Vedanta earlier or uh, other backgrounds, I'm a little curious, and if it's not at all pertinent, why say so? Oh, I don't mind saying so. I mean, it's, I don't really profess a religion in the sense that we normally recognize religion. I believe in more in self-development in the Zen sense. Well, I caught those the, the Zen elements from time to time. I thought in, in Dune, and uh, uh, in fact, the whole Zen Zuni school, I thought, was uh, an aspect of that. You know, don't you, that one element of the construction of this book, uh, it's all the way through there, that I wrote certain parts of it uh, in haiku and other poetical forms and then expanded them to prose to create a pace. I haven't picked those out specifically, but I, I sort of caught something of that, and that's... Uh, Some of my friends have come back to me with uh, uh -huh. examples out of it and said, was this a... Uh, haiku. Uh, was this a haiku? Or and, a taka uh, or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. or a taka. Yeah. And uh, yes, they're, they're in there. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's very good, and thank you very much. We certainly appreciate this.